For those of you who do not know us, my name is Brendra Banerjee. I am currently the president of ASC Lug, and I I really like the I really like home labs. I have my own personal home lab. I think it's really cool to have your own server that you can just use for whatever you want without paying a ton of money in a subscription model to someone else to host your stuff for you. And yeah, I'll let Trevor introduce himself. Hello everyone. My name is Trevor Batista. I too also have a home server and I'll admit it's probably one of my favorite pastimes to mess around with it. Um, I also agree that having your own hardware that you don't have, a ha have to have a subscription for is very awesome. And, uh, you know, it allows you to mess around with the said hardware, which is, uh, which is part of the fun, in my opinion, of hosting a home lab. Um, I'm an ASU student. Uh, I'm in the master's program in computer engineering at ASU. And... Computers uh, are a hobby and education, so. Yep, that's. Yep. And so just before we get too far into this, uh, do bear with us if there are any technical glitches. It should be fine, but, you know, should is only halfway, I guess. I don't know, I'm sure there's some saying that I could say, but I don't know it. So, yeah, basically this is the first event of this kind where it's fully virtual. Okay, no, the we had one of these last semester, but this is the first event where we actually have someone else in the who is hosting the event that is not here physically with me with the streaming hardware. So hopefully this goes okay, but do bear with us if there are any technical issues. And of course, do certainly feel free. Let us know in the chat if, for example, our levels are off or anything like that. And I will do my best to get it sorted. And I also do apologize for my kind of crappy lighting here against my green screen. So, sorry. Actually, Barindra, I can't even see anything on the live stream. Is that just my Discord being wonky? Uh, what you see in Discord is just my screen share, which is presently nothing. Okay. That's, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. What the, the actual stream on Twitch... Should have something. I hope it has something. But. Oh, it does have something. I forgot I have Twitch open right next to me. Alright, so without further ado, I think I will hand it over to you to get us started. Cool. Um, let me just. Open this real quick. So, yes, let's get started. Um, first, I want to start out with, I have yet to meet someone who is completely, who knows everything there is to know about home labs or even just servers. So, the prefix to this, um, I'm, I love to learn, and so if I miss something or if... Uh, Someone wants to jump in the chat and tell me something that is off about what I say or something. Feel free to do that because I like learning stuff and I think uh, it'll benefit everybody to get anything they need to know about uh, what we're talking about here today. So um, I'll start out with. Um, oh, tell people. OK, so my screen. Go ahead if you want to show it, Barindra. I'm just showing the uh, a table of the hardware that I have in my um, 
my home lab. I'll just briefly go over what my lab um, looks like and why I chose the things that I did. Uh, so I'll, pre uh, I'll start out with saying that um, my goals are probably different than um, the average home lab user. Since I started building this home lab while I was in undergrad, and I, during my undergrad, I moved around a lot. So um, I, I'd be very, very, very rarely would I be in one place. And so I wanted to build a home lab that was one small. So I, if I had it to move it, um, that was doable um, amongst all the other things that I had to move around. Uh, and two, since part of my time would be living uh, where power usage needed to be scarce uh, due to power build reasons, I wanted it to um, not use too much power. And let's see. Um, my primary uses for this lab initially were just kind of a general use case, uh, tinkering with various uh, web services or vir and even virtualization. So it needed a, a significant amount of cores, um, but also uh, a lot of storage because I plan to use this as a sort of storage pool, like a NAS network attached storage sort of deal. And so with all this in mind, I went with a micro ATX form factor, which is, if you don't know what that is, basically it's a smaller form factor compared to a full size tower. It's small, uh, not probably the next size down for that, but micro ATX is uh, not full size. So um, the first picture you see, uh, if you can see my screen here is uh, a picture of the inside of it. It's a the motherboard. And something special about this motherboard that we can talk about later if anyone wants to is it supports IPMI, which is basically a way to manage the uh, server out of band. So if, you know, if the server crashes or if something freezes on it, I can still remotely manage it, which is something that is very important for me since, you know, if I could move the server and I was, say, in California, and something happened, if it crashed, I could still manage it without having to, you know, go to Arizona, back to Arizona and, you know, restart it or something. Uh, I didn't have to do that at all. IPMI allows me to do that. Um, as far as RAM, uh, I would always recommend people if they're building a server, well, if they're building a storage server, I would definitely recommend ECC RAM, but uh, RAM right now is kind of expensive, so I have just um, 32, giga gigabyte, 32 gigabytes of Corsair Vengeance, uh, a non-ECC RAM. Um, I'm planning on changing that in the near future when I can. I have not gotten around to that yet. But um, as far as my the drives that I use, um, actually, if I go up here, if you see the very rightmost picture, it's sideways, but right here is a, a Samsung Evo SSD. That is my boot drive. It's 500 gigabytes. Um, it is only booting my OS. Um, and then from there, um, the actual storage drives that are used in my storage pool are different from the boot drive. So the, I have six Seagate Barracuda 2.5-inch uh, drives that are currently being used as a ZFS pool. And then the one other drive for my boot drive that I mentioned already. I don't have a GPU in the server. I have a tower that has a GPU that I use for various things, but um, one of the limiting factors about the uh, form factor in the case that I chose is that you can't really have a full-size GPU fit in the PCI slot directly. You would have to make, do some extras and some extra measures to get that to work, and so, and also, I didn't really have a, a immediate need for a GPU, so I don't have one right now. Uh, the case itself is an Apex ES539. It's a home theater PC form factor, which um, I don't really have a direct picture, but it's basically a uh, elongated, thinner 
um, form factor in micro ATX. Uh, the power supply is, uh, oh, it's not updated here. If I update my page, uh, it's a 350 watt uh, power supply. Let's see, yep, updated. And I, the, I have two um, NICs, so two, um, yeah, two NICs, and one of them is uh, is the typical um, gigabit port. Um, oh, I forgot to mention. So the the motherboard has two gigabit ports for general use cases. I originally used one of them for a dedicated uh, network attached storage to the server. I'm no longer doing that since I switched to using six. Um, the six core server engines, or sorry, the six um, um, Seagate drives, sorry, um, for the ZFS pool. Um, and the other one is just to uh, access the server remotely. And then one management port, which this is how I access the BIOS and uh, the, serial, the uh, network attached serial uh, connection. So, um, this is the port that I uh, interface with IPMI with. As far as the network, I just have a very old 2011 ASUS router that I just had sitting around. Um, has custom Padavan firmware on it that allows me more capabilities than the stock firmware on it. Um, as far as extra network attached devices uh, in my home lab network, the home network that the home lab is attached to, the home server is attached to, sorry. Uh, I have a separate Raspberry Pi that I'm currently using as a gateway uh, so that I can have a terminal that is not that is separate from the actual server. So if something happens with the server itself, I can interface with the IPMI directly on this device. Um, I also have an Arduino that is currently being used as an external temperature monitoring uh, device. I've, I have hardware set up with it to monitor temperature. Um, I've I had that set up since before I even built this server, so it's just kind of a legacy device, and so I've kept it um, functioning as of today. And I also have a cluster of four Raspberry Pi B pluses uh, that I use for messing around. Right now, I think I'm messing around with Kubernetes on it, or K3s to be specific. And those are attached to a separate switch that I can't remember the exact model of it, but if anyone wants to know, I can go look it up real quick. Um, and so that's about it in the home lab setup that I have right now. So Virindra, did you want to uh, talk about yours at all? Yeah, so uh, real quick, before we get too far into this, I do want to mention that the page that Trevor has been showing and the one and which I am going to put up shortly. You can access it by going to the link that was just posted in chat, or if you're on desktop, scroll down below the, the Twitch player, and there's a link there as well, or links.asu.edu slash asulog hyphen event if you want it verbally announced to you. So let me go ahead and switch to my screen share here. All right. So um, basically, for me, my use case is different from Trevor's. So one of the things that was very important to me is storage. I like I really was looking for a NAS first and foremost as the primary purpose of this machine. And you can see that by the fact that I have six, eight terabyte NAS drives 
in my system. But basically, my journey started with I want a NAS, and I also want it to be able to virtualize various software. Not necessarily software that's super intensive for as far as performance requirements, but like virtualize various software nonetheless, such as, for example, a unified controller for managing Ubiquity's access points. And so I ended up thinking Ryzen, AMD Ryzen, is, is really a pretty ideal architecture for this. Well, technically Zen is Zen and Zen 2 are the architecture, but the, the Ryzen series makes a lot of sense for what I want. It's pretty decent uh, single-threaded performance, definitely acceptable for this kind of use case that I have, but most importantly, you get a lot of cores and a lot of threads for a very reasonable amount of money. So we'll get back to exactly why I ended up with this processor, but so remember that I wanted a NAS first and foremost. So I ended up finding the Fractal Design Define R5, and you can see some pictures of it up here. There we go. So it has eight three and a half inch bays in the front. And I wanted to be able to populate all of those bays as well as the two two and a half inch drive mounts in the back and be able to connect all of them to the one motherboard, obviously. Now, that's a total of 10 SATA ports. And motherboards with 10 SATA ports are kind of few and far between. But, and, and what a lot of people will do, especially in the enterprise space, is just buy what's called a host bus adapter card. So those are just PCI Express cards that basically give you additional SATA ports or SAS or some other uh, storage drive standard, but we'll get more into that later. But the main issue, the main reason I didn't want to do that is because those, the, the actually good ones that would work best for uh, FreeNAS, which is the software I wanted to use for my network attached storage purposes, they, they need to basically allow FreeNAS to have low level access to the drives to have optimal performance. And there, it's it's kind of hard to find specific HBAs that are good and affordable and all that. So I wanted to avoid that if I was if I could. And it turned out that the ASRock X three seventy Tai Chi one it exists, and two it has ten SATA ports on the board. So that was basically the ideal choice for this project and the I wanted to use this with a Zen 2 or Ryzen 3000 based processor but uh, there were some compatibility issues being this is x370 chipset in theory it should have worked in practice not quite so good so I ended up just deciding on the Ryzen 7 Pro 1700X, which the all the Pro means is, first of all, the Pro chips, they're only sold to OEMs like Dell and Lenovo directly from AMD. So the only way to get your hands on them in in this sense is to buy them used from eBay or whatever. But anyway, that is exactly what I did, and this is 
I remember correctly, eight t eight sorry, eight cores and sixteen threads. And yeah, that was, I liked the core count, that was what I wanted, so it was fine. I mean, it's it's a little slower as far as instructions per clock and single-threaded performance, but you know, it's it's fine for what I'm going to be doing. And then the CPU cooler, this is just a good, relatively affordable and relatively quiet CPU cooler for Ryzen. Nothing special there. I probably could use the stock cooler. Well, because this is a pro part, this doesn't come with the stock cooler, but I could use a stock cooler if I wanted to, and it would probably be perfectly fine. So for RAM, uh, these are ECC memory modules. Uh, each of them is 16 gigabytes, I believe. Don't worry too much about the exact designations. Uh, these are basically almost exactly the same. And yeah, we'll we'll talk about RAM a little bit later as well. But this is ECC error checking and correcting RAM, and. An important factor in this case is that this is unbuffered because this is just the Ryzen platform, not Epic or Xeon. But anyway, the drives, as I mentioned before, WD RAD 8 terabytes. This was before any of the SMR scandals happened, so again, we'll get back to that soon. The Samsung SM961 256GB drives. These are PCI Express M.2 drives, and I'm using them as boot drives for XCPNG, which is my uh, hypervisor. So everything that runs on the system runs as a virtual machine under XCPNG. And these are XCPNG's boot drives in a software mirrored array configuration. And I also have these whatever Samsung drives from several years ago, 64 gigabyte drives, using them at, I will be using them as cache for free NAS once I get that set up. But these, the, there is something special about these. These are actually SLC or single level cell drives. So the, these can be, the, the write endurance of these drives, the NAND flash in these drives, is a lot greater than, uh, especially nowadays we have QLC quad level cell drives. So, yeah, GPU, I really did not need anything special. I was not doing anything performance intensive with the GPU. So this is just some ancient Radeon something or other that I had. It's good enough to get a basic terminal output so that I can uh, install XCPNG and then basically never use it again and always manage it from a different machine. Uh, yeah, power supply, Seasonic Prime Ultra 650 Platinum. It's a 650 watt, 80 plus platinum power supply. Quite efficient, which is good for the 24-7 operation that I have intended. And not insanely expensive either. You also, this is probably more, uh, this is probably a higher power rating than I need. But anyway, we will, we will deep dive into a lot of these components a little bit later. Uh, network interface card. So this is specifically referring to the PCI Express add-in NIC I have here. There is onboard NIC on the motherboard, Realtek something, but in dealing with servers and such where reliability and performance are of the utmost importance, uh, basically Intel is the way to go for 
network interface cards. And as for the fans, I actually replaced these two fans in the front and this fan in the back with some Noctua fans so that I feel a little bit better about all of these drives getting airflow mainly. And yeah, I guess that's pretty much it for now on the computer side. I saw a message in chat. A pure SAS HBA is the way to go for that. And yeah, you're you're definitely right, but everything costs money and you know in in this case I could get away without spending on a separate a dedicated HBA card. So that's why I wanted to do this. And yeah, SAS is in a lot of server applications a better protocol to work with than SATA. But when with consumer gear, most of this is just consumer gear, so it's it's pretty much SATA all around. Even on these uh, WD Red NAS drives, they only come in SATA. You have to actually go and buy the more expensive enterprise drives if you want SAS support. And as for my network, uh, I'm currently using a Ubiquiti Edge Router X as my router. It's a really nice little small box that you know, for, for what it costs and for how efficient it is in terms of power usage, it serves its purpose way better than any of that consumer-grade garbage that you can go and buy from Walmart or Best Buy or whatever. And access points, again, I, I, I really like a lot of Ubiquiti stuff. They've, they've done some things that I don't like, but... For the most part, their products are very solid, and the Unify APAC Pro is no exception. Very highly performant access point. And I also have two other random crappy consumer wireless routers in various locations. Notably, they are only functioning as access points, not as routers. But at some point I would like to replace those with better stuff. But haven't gotten around to that yet. So, yeah, that's basically my setup here. So, right, question. For people who are doing more network intensive lab work, Microtik is excellent. Yes, definitely. Um, if you're if you're looking to get into uh, network gear and enterprise networking type of stuff, Ubiquiti and Microtik are the, the companies you want to look at because these two companies are making enterprise grade gear at a prosumer price point. Interesting. Yeah. So. Yeah, Ubiquity and Microtech for networking, setting up your home network in a sort of professional network type of way. That's that's kind of a no question. You have other options like use Cisco gear, but software licensing can make that more difficult than it needs to be. And they're also older hardware, so you don't get to take advantage of some newer standards, like 802.11 AC, let alone AX, or what are they calling it now, Wi-Fi 3 or something. So, yeah, is there, did I miss anything there, Trevor? I don't think so. I, I I think I forgot to talk about my CPU too. I I built mine right on the cusp of when 
uh, Ryzen was coming out, and I didn't know if I wanted to go Ryzen or not. And um, honestly, my decision there a while ago, I think I'm the next the next home lab I'm going to build is definitely going to be AMD. But this uh, my choice with uh, Xeon here was right at the cusp, like I said, of Ryzen coming out, and so. And I knew that Xeon had been tested, tried and true, in servers for years. So that's why I chose this one. Now, this specific only has uh, this specific CPU only has uh, four cores, eight threads. But uh, definitely do for an upgrade. But um, it it works for what I currently use it for. So that's all I have to say for that. I didn't realize your Xeon was only a quad core. Yeah, it's. Uh, at least five years old, so I am. Um, it's due for an upgrade. Yeah. Um, oh, there was something I forgot to mention. I it just slipped my mind. Uh. Oh yeah. So, speaking of Xeons and buying Xeons. Well, first of all, I don't blame you for going Xeon because right around like when Ryzen first launched, it was. There were definitely a lot of issues, and those needed yeah. a while to be ironed out before Ryzen made sense in any even a home server sort of configuration. But um, I do want to talk about some options you can have for just buying decommissioned servers from whatever companies that are done with them. So, the Dell PowerEdge R710, that is one of the most popular, sort of like frequently recommended in home lab spaces servers that exists. There's, for, okay, even if we factor in shipping, this is under $200 for 8 cores, 24 gigabytes of RAM, uh, a Xeon server. I'm, I'm sure this has IPMI and all those server management features. Let's see, what do we have here? Redundant power supplies. It's like redundant. Yep. Yep. Redundant power supplies, serial output, VGA output. Basically, that's the kind of stuff you would expect. A few expansion slots, and we have also toolless drive sleds in the front. Looks like six of them on this specific model. So if all you're after is just cores, honestly, this is probably the cheapest way to get it, and you're going to get the most bang for your buck doing this. But if you are looking for a more balanced solution, there are a number of reasons why you would not necessarily want to get something like these PowerEdge R710s. And mainly, the, the most, probably the most important issue for a home lab use case is that you are basically buying a jet engine. You will turn the thing on, and it will be very, very loud. These server fans, for especially for 1U and 2U height servers, so for some context, in server racks, uh, I, don't, I should have not closed this, in server racks, space is measured in U's. So uh, this... Leaf is to you. Yeah, it looks like a yeah. two U. So this looks like a one U. That's a two U. This is one, two, three, four. This is ten U's, I guess. I don't know. That's a logo, so that's kind of weird. But anyway, uh, so basically. A, a U is a measure of height in a server rack, and it's a standardized unit, so 
basically any server you're looking at will have a certain U measurement. And when you're looking at 1U and 2U servers, so these are, like, you can tell just by looking at this, that's a really thin uh, computer. It's not very tall at all. And just imagine something half this height. So to get enough airflow through those, you need fans that spin at ridiculous RPMs. So they're really, really loud. Now, apparently with the R710, I don't have one myself to validate this, but supposedly the fans in this are not too bad once you get into the operating system and you have proper fan control going. But uh, I have actually heard one of these being booted up in person, and I would definitely classify it as jet engine. So... If you're building your home lab, especially like uh, in your room where you also sleep or whatever, um, definitely be aware that this is loud and also power hungry. And as a result of being power or related to being power hungry, these will spit out a lot of heat. They're not made for maximum efficiency. These are made for high reliability and they're designed for being stashed away in a rack in a data center somewhere where it's not going to bother anyone that it sounds like a jet engine. And another thing to keep in mind, because you are pushing air, you, you know, with these fans, they are pushing air through that, and the air, the purpose of doing that is to cool the components inside, right? So once the, you know, that air, it's the heat, the air has to go somewhere. And so I'm pretty sure Brindra is going to go here next, but these things can uh, also, because of that, generate some heat. So, you know, if you're going to sleep in the same room as this thing, it's definitely a consideration that a lot of people are going to need to consider uh, since you know you know i actually have, i can actually speak from experience because i i used to have a uh a 1u dell powerage 1950 and let me tell you my room was probably at least five degrees hotter with that thing in it and it was a pretty normal sized room for a bedroom so yeah that's that's definitely a very important point as well uh, I mean, if why OBS, OBS, please. <laughs> yeah, if you're if you're looking for a space heater and a home lab at the same time, you know maybe <laughs> one of these is not a bad way to go. But if you're living in Iceland, no, just kidding. Uh, but yeah, if you are looking for something like if if your standard for power efficiency is just your typical consumer computer systems, even even a gaming PC, maybe not a high end gaming PC, but sort of a mid range or lower end gaming PC. If that is your standard for power efficiency and heat output, you are going to have another thing coming with a lot of these um, decommissioned servers. But like I said, if yeah. if you're if you're looking for the specs alone, you're this is definitely the way to get the most bang for your buck. Like twelve core Xeon. 64 gigabytes of RAM, 4 terabytes of storage included. I wouldn't necessarily trust that, but, you know. Yeah. And redundant power supplies, this is just over $300. I mean, no matter how much you try, if you're building a computer yourself or buying something new retail, 
you're not going to do better than that. Especially Another, not... Another, uh, factor. Sorry, especially sorry, not if you're, uh, actually seriously looking into server boards with IPMI and all the remote management features. That's just, you're, you're going to be paying more than one of these systems alone just for the motherboard. Yes, and these these are definitely good options for quick and easy uh, home lab for cores and even for management interfaces. But one thing I will say from experience, oh, we got a, someone wants to share yep. that link. Uh, got that? Right. Okay. Uh, while he's doing that, uh, one another important factor, which I actually was one of the factors that helped me, wanted me to that. Um, helped me to come to a decision on whether I should build my own or not, is the power consumption with these uh, these power edges. Usually, the power edge that I had uh, was ran at about 250 watts. And if that's on, you know, 24-7, that can rack up quite a power bill. And, you know, actually, when I was building this, I was going to go live back home. And um, it, uh, definitely one of these was not an option if I wanted to have it on 24-7 or, or else I would be paying a lot of money. So um, that was one of, that's a, another option. To, one of the other um, factors to consider when wanting to get one of these is how much power are you willing to let run 24-7? Yep. And so let's see, I think... Uh, for those of you who are here watching live, do you have any immediate questions before we move on to something else? And also, uh, what, what brings you guys to this event? Are you looking to build a home lab of your own? What, what type of home lab are you interested in? Storage server, network? that up that's actually part of the fun of uh, home lab is it can be purposed for anything basically you know from virtualization to storage um, and that really is a driving point to what goes into the building or the customization of them so that's the fun part in my opinion yeah. It's always uh, fun to see what other people are using or repurposing those labs are for. What's our specialty? Okay, that's a bit of an interesting question. So uh, I guess I'll start talking a little bit. Um, I... It's hard to say exactly what my quote unquote specialty is, but in in general I've been I I like to follow more of the prosumer slash um affordable enterprise grade of hardware and ultimately as a result of just following that space for a while I've amassed a fairly decent knowledge about uh, computer components for this kind of home lab type usage but of course the one of my main focuses has been network attached storage so I I would say I've I'm I'm quite familiar with a lot of the hardware you would use for network attached storage but I, I can't say I quite have the wealth of knowledge about um, the specific sort of underlying principles such as ZFS that Trevor does. But yeah, but, I mean, basically for me, if you ask me for a recommendation on computer components, I can probably give you one. And same goes for 
networking at obviously this is at the home level not not really don't don't ask me for recommendations for a large enterprise because I'm not qualified to give you those but you know as a home user I can give you some good ideas just repeating myself now Trevor go ahead <laughs> I would have to agree with Brenda. I think, I mean, I can't really pinpoint a specialty, but um, uh, as you can tell, for, even as you can tell from my home lab, uh, as from my CPU, it's you know five years old. I built this thing a while ago, so even in that market, it's been a little bit since I've had to really consider parts. But um, I would say recently, as Brenda also said, um, I've been really dabbling a lot in uh, data redundancy specifically the CFS file system. Uh, if you have never heard of that file system, it's what uh, FreeNAS actually uses uh, under the hood for its uh, reliable data storage. Um, I personally don't, I guess I'll start with, I'll continue with what ZFS is before I talk about it. But um, basically it's a, not just a file system, it, it it's able to, um, People have called it also a logical volume manager because it, it it's the layers that it encompasses go below the file system layer. Um, and because of that, because it sees uh, more layers than just the file system layer, it's able to um, basically implement software redundancy like RAID. People are familiar with RAID. RAID uh, ZFS's implementation of that sort of paradigm is called RAID-Z. Um, and so when you're building a home server, specifically a NAS, it's really easy to have redundancy and when you just have a bunch of drives that you're putting into your machine. And um, setting it up is also very easy. There's only two ZFS commands, ZFS and ZPool. Um, and being, I would say I, that's one of my um, the big interests is just Data, data redundancy and storage and um, you know a lot of people will want to if they're building a NAS install something like free NAS or something that uses ZFS and is easy to manage uh, my in actually in my home server I uh, kind of built a ecosystem around just the ZFS command line and uh, so I didn't really install you know I didn't install free NAS with ZFS I just kind of uh, installed and configured ZFS the way I wanted it and kind of explored what that should look like. Um, and it's pretty that's pretty fun for me, but um, we can probably talk about ZFS or even just data redundancy later if anyone is interested in that, but that would be probably my specialty, quote unquote. Um, yeah, what else? Uh, yeah, so. I don't I don't know if there's really much more to say about that. I mean I neither of us are really super involved with the actual enterprise space that uses this hardware for actual business, so it's not like don't don't come to us for recommendations for what your medium or large business should do. I mean, for a small business, we can probably do pretty well for ourselves, but yeah, I I think I think that pretty much makes the point that we need to make. And you know, as as you guys, the the viewers now, as you guys are building your own home labs you will very quickly start to pick up on things that we have picked up over the few years or whatever that we've been doing this. There's, it's, it's really not that difficult. The learning curve is not that high, and even the, the cost of setting up a home lab does not have to be that high. So, like, obviously, like, like, uh, like I mentioned, 
the um, if you're going for a storage server that and you're looking for you're looking to buy all new brand new drives because buying used storage is not the greatest idea as far as ensuring reliability but you know if you if you're setting up a storage server and part of the one key aspect of that storage server is going to be you have a lot of redundancy as in for example if you have an array made of three drives if one of those drives fails then your data will survive unaffected and that's when you're when you're getting into that world of you're setting up lots of uh, reliability you're building that into your system to account for the shortcomings of the reliability of any individual component very often being mechanical hard drives that's when you know used storage becomes less of a scary thing and more of a reasonable way to save money but yeah so that i think that takes us pretty well into an important point we want to make about smr drives so you will no doubt notice that we have both included these large warnings do not accidentally purchase SMR drives. Um, basically, a few months ago now, I think. Was it that long ago? I don't remember. There Sounds was right. this big scandal with pretty much all the hard drive manufacturers about them putting what are what's called drive managed smr recording technology into all these drives that we that pretty much everyone has taken for granted for a long time to be cmr drives and so specifically what these terms mean cmr stands for conventional magnetic recording and smr stands for shingled magnetic recording so in without getting into the the details about exactly how the technologies work basically CMR drives are what where what the whole world has been used to for a long time SMR drives a few years ago started showing up in uh enterprise drives where SMR drives make sense because they offer a lot more data density. So you can have larger drives, you can have more data on each individual platter of a hard drive, which lets you have more data in inside your drive as a whole. And for something like an enterprise archive drive, that's perfectly fine. You want as much data density as possible so you have to buy fewer drives, you save money on the individual drives. And the the main the primary downside of SMR is the write speed. So because of exactly how SMR drives have to write data to the platters, it takes significantly longer to write data on SMR drives than on CMR drives. So that, I mean, that's perfectly fine when your use case is designed around that, like enterprise archival, and you have software that is that expects SMR, knows how to work with it, and all that. There, that you will not have a problem there. But the issue is that these drive manufacturers started putting SMR technology in these consumer drives and sort of prosumer NAS drives. And you can 
SMR definitely does not bring a benefit to the consumer in those spaces, to be completely clear. In theory, the costs of drives could go down, but that really hasn't happened. So anyway, the main issue, the main scandal was that these were using what's called drive-managed SMR, where the firmware inside the hard drive manages the SMR and your your host system, your computer, talks to the drive as if it's a CMR drive and doesn't know that it's SMR, that it's actually SMR inside the drive. So basically, the fact that these were SMR drives was completely not unlabeled and unknown to many people for a long time until the community came together and was finding performance issues with a lot of these drives that we now know to be SMR drives inside NAS applications, where the 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 main the main um, the main time when these issues would arise is when you're rebuilding the array. So if you have a drive that fails and you replace it with a good drive, then you need to rebuild your RAID or RAID Z array so that you are back up to having the full amount of redundancy that you are supposed to get. So this the rebuilding process is it puts a lot of writes on the drives on the new drive very quickly and what was happening is um, various NAS software was actually erroring out because the drives were taking too long to complete the rebuild. In, in I think one case that I remember offhand it took over two days to for the for the software to just error out and give up when the rebuild should have been done in just a couple of hours with a CMR drive. So, yeah, basically, back to the main point is that be very careful about what drives you're buying, especially if you're buying new drives, retail drives. You... If you're buying your typical consumer drives, there's a very strong chance those are SMR and you will have no way of knowing it. If you are buying drives that are actually advertised for use in a NAS, then it kind of depends. So Western Digital actually started making, started having some of their WD red drives, their their entry level NAS drives, as SMR drives. And the only way to know that was a single character in the model number. So that and they have not backed down on that, so a lot of WD red drives are SMR drives. You don't want those. If you are if you are buying WD red drives, there is a very strong chance that you do not want an SMR drive, and you should not get an SMR drive. Seagate, on the other hand, Seagate also secretly added, changed some of their consumer drives to SMR, but at least they did not do that with their NAS drives. So all of Seagate's Iron Wolf drives, as far as I know, this is still the case. I have no idea how long this will be the case, forever maybe, or I don't, I don't know. But for now, if you buy a Seagate Iron Wolf drive, it's going to be CMR. That's a much better bet than WD Red, in my opinion. So even though back when I purchased all these drives, they were all WD Reds. If I'm buying more drives, I'm not buying any more WD Reds. At least not for the foreseeable future. So, 
yeah, that's SMR drives in a nutshell. That is probably the single biggest mistake you can make nowadays setting up a home lab, especially as a storage server. So do not make that mistake. Make sure before Just you keep... purchase drives that you get the exact model number and you look it up. Make sure it uses CMR, not SMR. Otherwise, you're in for a bad time. Right. Go Do you ahead. have a... Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, Do you have a uh, go-to drive now that uh, WD Red has... is That line of drives is has seen a lot of SMR drives? Is there a go-to line for you? Or do you just kind of have to, in your mind, research um, each one case by case? Well, so I haven't needed to get any new drives since I purchased these, but at the point that I do purchase new drives, if if I was purchasing new drives today, they would almost certainly be Seagate Iron Wolf drives. And yeah, I'm not even though I do know which WD Red drives are the SMR drives versus the CMR drives, just the way that WD has handled the situation has completely turned me off from purchasing from them. So, you know, obviously everyone out there, you're welcome to make your own decision, spend your own money however you see fit. But, you know, personally, I, WD has left a very sour taste in my mouth, and I will be giving Seagate my business in the for the foreseeable future as a result. Yeah, that makes sense. I actually, some of the hot, hot spare drives that I have for my ZFS pool are Iron Wolf drives, and um, they... You know, I bought those after doing some research on them. Oh, so, um, yeah. Yeah, so, um, Devin, I, I hope that helped you out a bit with your sort of storage server plans. I know you and I have chatted a fair bit previously about um, options for you, what, what sort of components to look for. But yeah, basically, I'm just going to give a quick rundown on stream for everyone else. Uh, I don't remember specifically what, what all the requirements were that Devin told me, but I do remember that I recommended him use the uh, use a Ryzen CPU just like I have and of course you want to get Zen 2 if possible so the Ryzen 3000 series CPUs and uh, yeah if you're if you're trying to do a sort of general purpose build that will sit in your home and you will you will literally have a home lab and then Ryzen is a very good option right now. So yeah, any questions at this point for those of you who are watching? Questions, comments? I think in the meantime, uh, let's talk about some of our other components. So, uh, Trevor, I will hand it over to you to, I don't know, explain some component choice. Okay. Um, let's see. I've already talked about my CPU. Uh, that was, again, on the cusp of Ryzen, and I decided to play it safe and stay with Xeon. As far as my motherboard, um, that was kind of a... There's 
significantly more requirements that I had for that. As I mentioned before, I, I needed to have IPMI because I I have I would need to be spending significantly a lot of time away from the server, and if something goes wrong, you know, say a crash happened and it shut down for some reason, I needed out of band management capability. Um, and so this motherboard has a specific, um, a specific, specifically separate um, NIC on the motherboard for this purpose. And again, you can find IPMI in most Blade server, you know, like the, we, we looked at the PowerEdge R720 or 10, I can't remember which one it was. R710. And um, 710, yeah. And those, they, those do come with it in um, IPMI enabled. Uh, a lot of consumer motherboard probably won't because you don't really, it's not really needed. You know, if you're building a tower PC or even a home theater, you don't really need that. You're not going to be away. But so finding, if you want that capability, you're going to have to really look and um, find specifically motherboards that support that. Um, when I got this motherboard, as I said before, I needed it to support, aside from my PMI, two separate NICs. And again, that was because I previously I was using uh, a Western Digital, um, I think it was called MyCloud, that attached it, that is attached via the network to the server. Uh, that was when I was kind of figuring out uh, how storage, want, how I wanted storage to work. Um, but I, you know, it, it's always nice to have another NIC, you know, if you need something else attached to the server or something like that. Um, I don't really need that now, but um, if you do need, you know, I think uh, in the chat we had someone want, who wanted to do some network stuff. Um, a lot of times when you build home labs, uh, some people will are building that with a lot of networking stuff in mind. And... Um, Barindra, he uh, bought a separate uh, Intel um, NIC for a PCI card. Um, that's definitely, if I had to redo my purchase, I would probably consider that because Intel, like he said, is NIC cards. Or that's kind of redundant, NICs. Uh, um, you cut out for a minute. Um, what was the last thing? Uh, Intel is kind of, and you said something after that. Um, Intel, as Barindra noted, makes good, uh, reliable NICs. Yeah. And so, you know, even if your motherboard doesn't have more than one NIC and you need another one, it's no big deal, really. Um, except in my case, I'm, I was go, I'm, I went with uh, Micro ATX, uh, specifically a very thin home theater case. And so I had to keep that in mind when I was building my my server because um, yeah. it has a, a thinner uh, chassis. And so full-sized cards like some um, GPUs, most GPUs and even some other PCI cards, uh, are limit. I am limited in, on my choices there. So you kind of have to consider that's probably the hardest part, in my opinion, about um, building, about choosing your parts, is uh, knowing what, um, knowing what your parameters are, like case uh, size or, um, or what cards you need on the actual motherboard. Um, that's probably, in my opinion, the hardest part of choosing stuff to. Um, for your for your lab um yeah to as far as to, to add on real quick about nick network interface cards um it's it's not even just reliability and performance that make intel nix just basically the best option for servers it's also compatibility so especially with a lot of the server software you might run it's it's often based on things like FreeBSD or Linux, and so sometimes you get so maybe if you're running a Windows system on the same hardware, your NIC performs just fine, but 
the the drivers for other operating systems like Linux or FreeBSD might not be quite as uh, well developed or optimized so that so you could run into some performance issues there especially for uh, free NAS and other things based on FreeBSD this can really be a problem and uh, my Previous NAS was actually just based on uh, this Dell pre-built tower that I had lying around. That had a real technique, and you could you could visibly see the 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 fact that the NIC was definitely limiting the performance of the server. So. Yeah, and also outright compatibility issues. So, especially if you're doing things like PFSense and you're setting up a your machine for a networking use case, just just buy an Intel NIC. Don't even think twice about it. And of course, if your motherboard comes with Intel, um, an Intel NIC integrated into it, that works just fine. But you can also if that's not the case, you can find all kinds of like various Intel gigabit NICs for easily under thirty dollars on eBay or whatever, and because they're ubiquitous in the enterprise market too. Yeah, I think in general, uh compatibility wise with software the main category of component that you want to look out for regarding that are uh, just general pci slots like you know a, a nic that you're going to add uh or even a gpu especially a uh, gpu is actually significant um so uh, when you're buying uh something to attach via pci or pcie definitely look at the compatibility of that device with the software that you're running. Yeah, and uh, also about um, sizing issues that I think you talked about a little bit earlier. If you can get small form factor cards, so a lot of a lot of these PCI Express cards that you can get, including GPUs and very commonly NICs, they come in PCI Express variants as well. So I have um, I have a, another PCI Express Intel NIC add-in card that I was using in my old NAS before decommissioning that. And so that one, I actually, I believe I bought that retail. It still wasn't that expensive but it actually included a half height uh, bracket so that if you don't have the full height available of the PCI Express slot in the back of your case, you can use the half height version and it, and yeah, and it's a lot of this sort of prosumer slash enterprise gear is actually designed with that in mind. So if it's not something like a GPU which is huge and you can't really get uh, a per powerful GPU into a half height form factor then you can just just keep an eye out for the hardware you can get in half height and you know if that's good enough for you then you can build a sort of smaller slimmer server All right, so I know I interrupted you as you were about to talk about something, so do go ahead. Uh, I can't remember what I was going to say, but uh, I think I'll end with just talking a little bit about my power supply. Um, I chose a, um, the Seasonic Modular one mentioned here, the three, uh, 350 watts. I... Definitely, definitely something to consider is what 
you'll be running and what components you'll be using to run it. Um, for instance, you know, if you have a GPU and you're doing a lot of GPU work, uh, GPU takes some power, it takes significantly, um, it takes a significant amount of power. And so you're gonna want a higher rated power supply for that. Uh, as far as my power supply, I don't even have a GPU and I really only have um, seven hard drives and um, a CPU. And so I don't really need too much of a, a rated, I don't really need a high rated power supply. And so I was able to go with um, the Seasonic one. Um, Brindra can probably talk a little bit more about power supplies. Uh, he knows probably more about that than I do. But uh, as far as um, power usage, uh, if you don't really know uh, what that's going to look like, it's always safer to go up. You know, if you if you go with a 650 or a watt power supply, uh, that's probably safe. But if you know, if you if you want to be on the safe side, sorry, if you want to uh, really hone in what you're doing, then you can also do that too, and be specific about it. Yeah, so if, um, along those lines, if you're not sure what sort of power usage your system is going to look at, just go to uh, PC Part Picker. Uh, I'm not... I... It's... Honestly, if you're, if you're building a PC, th this site will make your life so easy go into the system builder here and then just choose the components you want and then or start with the components that you know for sure you want and then uh, PC part picker actually has a lot of uh, built-in compatibility filters so it will actually check for you what other parts are compatible with the parts you've already chosen and you know, a lot of the time, you don't even need to to do anything but look at this. Now, if you're going for, for more of a home lab build, especially if you're doing not super standard mainstream PC components, you probably want to take the time to manually look into the compatibility yourself. But, you know, I mean, PC Part Picker will still catch a lot of it for you. Just, for example, don't expect a Ryzen Pro CPU that you cannot physically buy retail to show up on here necessarily. And uh, I don't have the link handy right now, but I actually, I used this website to set, um, figure out the builds for both my streaming computer and my server it's it's definitely like a great website to use for that and it will back to the discussion of power supplies it will actually estimate the wattage you need in a power supply for you based on your components so uh, yes, and I've actually used uh, PC Pie Picker as well, but sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, so, and of course, like, like Trevor said, if you want to be on the safe side, go up. So if this tells you, oh, you need 450 watts, maybe you want to get a 500 watt power supply just to be safe, whatever. Um, and now to uh, discuss using a power supply a little bit more in depth. So you'll notice I went for this is all just pure branding. It doesn't mean anything. This is the wattage that my power supply is rated for and then this is the what's called the 80 plus rating of this power supply. So obviously this whole thing is the model name and different manufacturers will name their units differently, but a lot of them will include the wattage and 80 plus rating in the name. 
but even if not, you can go and look for it. So if you have an 80 plus certified power supply, that means your power supply meets certain efficiency criteria at, uh, for example, 80% load and various other um, various other uh, percentages of the rating power rating of your power supply. So uh, basically, 80 plus was initially created as a standard that meant you have 80 percent efficiency at, I believe it's 50 percent load, but don't quote me on that. And as energy, as the demand for energy efficiency kept increasing and more energy efficient power supplies came out, uh, we ended up with the original 80 plus rating is now known as 80 plus white. And on top of that, we also have bronze, silver, uh, gold, uh, platinum, and titanium in that order and I might have missed something but anyway that's so that's the general idea of your 80 plus rating gives you uh, it's it's not a complete understanding of the efficiency of your power supply but it give it's a good indicator for what is meant to be an efficient power supply versus what was meant to be cheap and by that same token, it also has some relevance to whether a power supply is built and designed well versus built and designed to be cheap. But don't, don't make the mistake of conflating an 80 plus rating with an actual uh, build quality analysis, though. So, Two main websites that are looking that are worth looking into here. So uh, johnnyguru.com, and I'm, I will post these links in the chat. And the PSU tier list on the Linus Tech Tips forum. And OBS is showing the wrong window again. So these are basically my bad I forgot to screen share okay so Johnny Guru power supply reviews you can see uh, he obviously cannot do a review of every single power supply but if there's a power supply that you're considering and he's reviewed it go read his review he really knows his stuff. He so there's obviously the specs that the manufacturer gives you, but he will do a lot of very detailed testing of the efficiency, the noise. He'll tear down the unit and show you pictures of the inside. Look, it's six pages of power supply reviews. That's if you can fill up six pages with actual information about a power supply then you know your stuff. And the other the other link I mentioned is um, the PSU tier list on the Linus Tech Tips forum. So basically, most every power supply under the sun is listed somewhere in here, or at least the ones you can buy retail in North America. So it, they're all sorted Tier A, recommended for high-end systems. Tier B, mid-range systems, and so on. Tier C, etc. So basically, the, the whole premise behind this is that it's really not worth cheaping out on a power supply, especially for a system that you actually care about. So if you're running, if you want to have a 24-7 server, don't cheap out on your power supply. That is a horrible idea. 
go onto the PSU tier list, go onto Johnny Guru's website, look at what power supplies are good. For 24-7 operation, I would strongly recommend stick to tier A and don't go anywhere else. My my power supply, the Seasonic Prime Platinum 650, that is listed right here under tier A. I use this tier list myself when I was choosing my power supply. So, yeah. Don't, don't cheap out on your power supply. 80 plus rating means efficiency and uh, more expensive or I don't know if it's more expensive. I guess rarer uh, metal equals better efficiency. So, yeah. And I would add, yeah. um, if you really need something up 24-7, consider getting a UPS or an, an interruptible power supply to supplement yes. your server. Uh, I actually have one. I forgot to mention. It's, a, um, it's rated at about uh, 800 watts. Um, I have my server and my router plugged into it. Uh, a lot of times when your power goes out, um, obviously that's going to be detrimental to your server if you have a process running that needs to be run be running 24 7 um, as with power supplies you're going to want to rate you're going to want to uh, do your research and um, rating the wattage of it uh, based on what you're going to plug into it as well um, and what's cool about the ups is, is you can actually uh, replace the batteries in them so if it goes bad, you can. I've actually re already re um, uh, replaced the batteries in this one since it's a couple of years old. Um, um, and uh, you can plug multiple things in to them, but just be careful. Uh, as with regular power outlets, um, plugging in um, um, what are they called? Power strips. Power strips. Yeah. Uh, be very. Don't. If you can, don't plug in power strips with a bunch of stuff in it because that can be detrimental to the UPS. Um, but again, if you need something up 24-7, uh, it's worth getting one. Yeah. I can say that from experience. In in general, with uninterruptible power supplies, the um, one of the main things to look for is a true sine wave output. There's pretty much every cheaper UPS out there uses what's called a modified sine wave output. So if you actually um, look with an oscilloscope, obviously don't do this unless you actually know how to do it safely, at the output you get from a UPS when it's running off battery. So for example, if your wall power, if, you're, if you have a blackout or you just simulate a blackout by unplugging it, um, what you will see in modified sine wave U UPSs is just a bunch of square waves. But the, the power that you should have from the wall is a sine wave. So you be very careful about that for some like cheap random thing that really is not that important. Modified sine wave UPS is probably perfectly fine, but for something like a server, especially if it's a relatively expensive thing and you want it to work optimally, definitely get a true sine wave UPS. Don't even waste your time with the modified sine wave ones. In theory, a good computer power supply can handle that that kind of uh, noisy input, I guess, is one way to put it. But I personally, I wouldn't even waste my time on that. And another thing is, so keep in mind the difference between power and energy, right? So power, like 800 watts, as Trevor said his UPS is rated for, 
that is the instantaneous load that you can draw from the unit. And so that's like your power supply has a power rating. Your PC part picker gives you a power rating. That is different from energy, which is power over time. And energy in a UPS is dependent on how big your batteries are, how many batteries are in there. And so you, you can divide your energy available in your UPS by the power at any given point or the average power of your computer system or whatever other device you have plugged into it to get an idea of the amount of time that the UPS will be able to keep your system powered and operational. So now with that said, one very common use case for a UPS is just to gracefully shut down the system in the event of a power outage, or if the power outage lasts more than whatever specified amount of time. And this is what you will see in data centers as well. They have lots of very energy intensive uh, servers running in there. They just, it would be completely cost prohibitive, space prohibitive, and just everything prohibitive to actually have a UPS large enough to keep the data center, the entire data center running for more than maybe a couple of hours at best. So you will, what happens is they have, they're, they're still massive UPSs, and usually in a data center you actually have a specific room that is a UPS or has a UPS built into it. But the, the, the general thing you want to set up is so that if the UPS has to switch to battery power for whatever reason, it will communicate with your computer and tell it to shut down gracefully. As opposed to in, without a UPS just basically having the power plug from your computer. And a lot of UPSs, except maybe the really, really cheap ones, are designed to be able to communicate with a computer to tell it that there is no more wall power shut down gracefully. All right. Uh, as always, just a reminder, if you have any questions, comments, etc., do post them in the chat. We are looking at the chat. So, All right, do you have anything to add to that, Trevor? Uh, I will just say that I actually, my the UPS that I have uh, has a, a USB connection to it, and I currently have that plugged in. And there's a daemon running on the machine that is able to communicate with that uh, UPS and actually do stuff when events happen. So it's very very useful. Um, but, but that's uh, kind of a closing thought on that. Oh, um, actually, did you want to talk about your hardware? Uh, oh, okay. Real quick, one more thing I forgot to mention is uh, line interactive UPSs. So some UPSs, this is usually higher end ones, are what's called line interactive. So that means if you have dirty wall power coming from your power company, so for example, if your sine waves start to look more like square waves, or you have... Uh, your voltage is out of spec, then a line interactive UPS can clean up that wall power and make it basically the the nice pristine wall power that you ideally want. And so in the case of computer power supplies, usually, especially if you're not pushing the power supply very close to its 
rated power output, they will be fine dealing with even fairly significantly dirty wall power. But, you know, if you want to really be on the safe side, then uh, line interactive UPS with a true sine wave output, although I would expect that if you get a line interactive UPS that has a true sine wave output, is the way to go. So, all right. Uh, so what were you going to say there, Trevor? Uh, honestly, I was just going to hand it over to you. So. Oh, well. All right, so. Again, let us know in the chat what sort of systems you guys are interested in, storage servers, networking, whatever. We're both fairly familiar with the software and hardware that you would use for any of those use cases. So, uh, let's, let me check if I got everything that I wanted to mention. Oh, RAM. We haven't talked much about RAM, have we? Oh, wow. Yeah, we haven't. Yeah, so RAM is, like, it's one of those things where for a consumer system, just your average DIY uh, gaming computer or whatever, you don't really think much about the RAM. You're like, okay, DDR4, I want the faster the better. So let's see, 3600 megahertz, sure, great. But it's actually a lot more complicated than that when you're talking about the the server space and the, the enterprise space. So first of all, there's what's known as ECC RAMs. That's error checking and correcting RAM. I don't know if that's actually what it stands for, but that's what it does. So what that means is your RAM stick actually has an extra chip on it, which will, uh, in, in, if in the case of certain sort of RAM errors, uh, like a bit flip, for example, so if, if you are operating your system near an asteroid belt, a really strong magnetic field, particle accelerator, where, where else would you get these sort of RAM errors? Cosmic rays. Yeah, if you're operating your system near any of those uh, phenomena, then you can, you can expect to, to have some bit flips and whatever in your RAM. So what ECC RAM does is it's it's twofold. So first it can detect when those errors occur using a parity mechanism. Uh, parity the right word? I don't know. Whatever. It, it can detect the, when those errors occur and for certain types of errors it can actually correct the problem and your system will run as if there was never an error in the first place. Now that's a related topic is unbuffered versus buffered and registered memory. So for the purposes of this discussion, let's just go with, let's just, let's agree that buffered and registered memory are basically one and the same. They're technically not one and the same, but if you're buying buffered memory it's almost certainly registered and if you're buying registered memory it's almost certainly buffered as far as i know you cannot buy the those two items separately in any currently available ram stick so let's just go with buffered memory versus unbuffered memory and just keep in mind that 
if you're getting buffered memory, it's also probably registered memory. So your typical consumer systems, they use unbuffered memory. Whereas your uh, typical sort of proper servers with Xeons or Epics, those use buffered memory almost always. And ECC memory is most commonly found in servers, which is why ECC memory is almost always, almost always comes hand in hand with buffered memory and registered memory. So, and unbuffered memory, you can get unbuffered memory with ECC. The, the specific memory I purchased, so let's share my screen here. So these are unbuffered ECC uh, DIMMs. And so for Ryzen, Ryzen is a consumer platform. That's not a server platform. So I, you can only use unbuffered memory with Ryzen. Now... Ryzen does support ECC, well, I use the word support loosely, it's technically the ability is there and not locked out, but it's not, no one's actually going to help you with it if you are, like, talking to AMD or your motherboard manufacturer for help. So... Basically, ECC unbuffered memory is very expensive because it's very it's pretty rare, and the the use cases for it are fairly limited. Since you don't see this in your typical data center server, and uh, so basically, unbuffered memory and buffered memory they are not interchangeable. Unbuffered memory goes in, uh, goes with a CPU and motherboard that supports unbuffered memory. Buffered memory slash registered memory goes with a CPU and motherboard that supports that. The even the the RAM slots on the board are physically different, so it's not like you can put one in the other and then the system just won't boot. It just, you can't, you physically can't put one in the other. So, do be aware of that. If you're looking for ECC memory on Ryzen, you have to get ECC and unbuffered memory. You cannot get registered memory slash buffered memory. And Intel's Mainstream CPUs do not support ECC at all, so don't even waste your time looking. Just buy the best value standard DDR3 or DDR4 or whatever non-ECC unbuffered memory that you can find. All right, do you have anything to add to that, Trevor? Uh, I'll just add... Uh, just to kind of generalize what you're saying. So usually when you're looking at RAM and you're considering ECC and unbuffered, you're going to want to look at uh, your CPU and your motherboard if they support those. And both of them have to support it to have it uh, work. Um, and actually, I can speak from experience that uh, um, you will want, you definitely want to... Um, Get the, you want to make sure that is the case, especially with buffered versus unbuffered, because I've actually bought the wrong RAM before, and it fits in the buffered RAM slot, or unbuffered RAM slot, buffered does. And so, um, and obviously the machine won't boot up if it's if it's uh, different. So I can speak from experience that uh, um, buffered versus unbuffered that does matter for your machine. Now, I will... Um, Usually, since registered, which I'll use interchangeably here with buffered, uh, the uh, usually unbuffered uh, RAM will uh, come in. Well, you can only have smaller um, 
capacities per stick of it. Uh, and the reason behind that is um, the reason, one of the things that adding a buffer or register in between the CPU's memory controller and the um, memory devices, memory cells themselves, is that it puts less load on that CPU's memory controller. And that allows you to have more um, RAM sticks with registers in them so that uh, since since the less of a load is, is uh, being put on the CPU's memory controller. And so when you're looking for um, motherboards and CPUs and RAM, that combination, and it, and you're looking for more RAM, my suggestion would be to look for uh, buffered RAM, whether ECC or not. Usually it's going to be ECC. Uh, when you're doing a server, it's, it's usually worth going ECC. There's no, the price difference is, I didn't really see a difference in the price. Uh, I mean, there is a difference, but not significant. Well, um, if you're talking about unbuffered ECC, that is very significantly more expensive than unbuffered non-ECC. Yes, no. um, but buff. So uh, my motherboard uh, only supports unbuffered, and so I'm only able to get a max amount of RAM for my motherboard of about sixty-four gigabytes of RAM. Yeah, that's... Uh, but if you need more for specifically that? for DDR4, uh, unbuffered memory is limited to sixteen gigabytes per stick of RAM, whereas um, yes. registered slash buffered memory. I believe you can get 64 gigabytes on a single stick, if not 128 even. Right. So per stick, it's gonna, uh, unbuffered is going to be less. And so my motherboard in spe uh, specifically has four slots, and uh, it only supports unbuffered. So in that case, if I had you know the maximum of 16 gigabytes of un uh, unbuffered memory per stick, I'd only be able to go to, go up to sixty four gig gigabytes of RAM. So if you need more for say a virtualization server or something like that, you'll definitely want to look at buffered RAM. I would recommend buffered ECC RAM since yeah, um, you are building a server here. Do do realize also with that that if you can't get buffered RAM unless your CPU and motherboard support it. So even if you're getting so buffered ECC RAM, that's pretty cheap because the vast majority of servers use that. So it's produced in massive quantities. But the the CPUs and motherboards themselves that support that tend to be quite a bit more expensive than your typical consumer motherboards, like the X370 Tai Chi I have in my system, which are limited to um, unbuffered memory. And yeah, just to illustrate the point about the maximum memory per stick, so these, I have four 16 gigabyte sticks of unbuffered ECC RAM, and that fills up all of my four RAM slots that I have in the system. So my system is maxed out at 64 gigabytes of RAM, and there's no way for me to add any more. All right, I think we have a message here. What are the factors to consider when choosing buffered versus unbuffered ECC RAM? Are they max memory capacity and price? So the decision for buffered or unbuffered is made for you by the motherboard and CPU you choose. That's not a decision you get to directly make. You can indirectly make the decision by choosing a different CPU and motherboard, but you can't say, I want an X, I want, so for example, my uh, X370 Tai Chi, I can't say, okay, I want to put in some buffered memory. I can't do that, it just won't work. So, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yes, um, I would. 
are you um if you if you how the the decision though with ECC RAM is is different. So if you're deciding whether to put ECC RAM into your server or not, then um, you can actually make that decision. But buffered versus unbuffered, that's up to your motherboard and CPU, like Barendra said. Yeah. So basically, in in summary, with RAM, it's if you're building your computer based on a consumer platform like AMD Ryzen or Intel's Core series, you can only use unbuffered memory, period. And uh, if you're using Intel's Core series, then you cannot use ECC, period. But if you're using AMD Ryzen, you can use unbuffered ECC RAM, which is basically the most expensive and hardest to find type of RAM. But it is ECC RAM still, and you are saving more money on your platform and motherboard. So by going AMD Ryzen and choosing a Ryzen motherboard, you're saving several hundred dollars by doing that rather than buying a server board with a server CPU to get support for uh, buffered ECC RAM. Now, to be clear, if you need crazy amounts of RAM in your system, like if you need 128 gigabytes, you still might be able to do that in a select few consumer boards, but you probably won't get, at that point, the cost savings. If, if you're putting ECC RAM in that system, the cost savings may no longer make sense because of how much extra you have to pay to get eight sticks of, or in the case of DDR4, eight sticks of uh, 16 gigabyte um, unbuffered ECC modules. Now, uh, the other, a very, another very important point is that, um, not all, especially on the consumer side, not all motherboard BIOSes implement ECC the same way. So some of them, and this was another reason I chose my ASRock motherboard that I did, is ASRock apparently implements ECC relatively completely. Let me see here if I can quickly pull up the what I saw there um, Uh, okay, I can't find it quickly, but anyway, the point is, um, there are different levels, sort of, of, uh, ECC error correction that can be enabled or not enabled by the, or in the BIOS, so, for the AM4, AMD Ryzen platform, ASRock has one of the the best reputations for ECC support and I think some other boards from other manufacturers are similarly good in that way but it's just if you're going for ECC RAM this is it's kind of it's kind of difficult with consumer platforms because there's not very much information out there it's th this kind of thing tends to be not very thoroughly tested so that's you you just have to be aware of something like that and uh i think another important point to make is why go ecc 
well, it's it's mainly for peace of mind, really. It it depends on. Uh, so statistically, it probably won't actually do anything for you, to be completely honest. But you know, if you want to be extra safe about avoiding things like uh, data corruption, data poisoning, that sort of thing, then ECC might be worth considering. But obviously do consider the price and the fact that not all motherboards implement ECC the same. And one last note on that. If you need to test whether ECC is working on your system, this is something I spent so long trying to figure out a good way to test this. As in something more than just the the motherboard bias reporting to the operating system that you have ECC RAM and ECC is enabled. So if you want to actually test whether ECC works, overclock your RAM to a ridiculous set of timings and just run something like memtest86 and stress the RAM. You should see a lot of uh, ECC correctable and uncorrectable errors coming up in your log and when, when you're seeing those correctable errors that is the the perhaps the truest indication that ECC is actually working on your system. Now of course before you go to actually use the system for some real usage set your RAM back to reasonable timings if not what your your standard JEDEC timings that are preset in the motherboard BIOS and by the RAM stick I mean, if you're overclocking your RAM, basically uh, do it responsibly, and you should already know what you're doing if you're looking into overclocking your RAM. But if you're not familiar with overclocking your RAM, just don't do it for a server. Just, just don't. And on, on overclocking in general, for a server-like system, you generally want to stick to mild overclocks that that so you have the utmost instability or just don't overclock at all. In my case, I have so on my streaming computer I do have a relatively mild overclock on my uh Threadripper CPU, but my server that's something I want it to even when I'm not around to reboot it or fix it or whatever, I expect that to continue running. And so that's where I don't even want to try overclocking that. I just run it at stock speeds. And yeah, so a lot of the con conventional mental wisdom about which CPU to buy based on the, the idea that you can buy a slightly cheaper CPU and then just overclock it to make up the performance difference between, say, the next CPU and the product stack, that you may want to um, not focus on that too much with a server because the the benefit of just buying the more expensive CPU is that it's already validated at whatever speeds it's running at. So you don't need to spend a bunch of time stress testing it to be confident in your overclocks or anything like that. But you know, to each their own, if you are uh, less risk averse than I am, you're more than welcome to overclock your CPU, overclock your RAM, overclock whatever you want. But do just just be aware of the risks, basically.
All right. Any closing thoughts, Trevor? I was trying to think of some, but I can't think of any. Um, obviously, this is a lot of information. Um, you know, I think for the people that really want to customize their machines, uh, their servers and whatnot will find a lot of this information useful. For others who just want to start building a, you know, a, um, a home server, a lot of this is kind of just there. You know, you'll probably find out about it later on or come back to this if you want to um, know more about it. I think, you know, when I was starting to build mine, um, it was kind of just a lot of experience. It was an experience to build it. And um, a lot of what I learned it, it, for what is possible and what I, what I want to do later on came from that actual action of doing it. Um, so I would say don't let all of this information deter you from doing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, this I, it's not even just servers. It's just any computer in general. Building yeah. your first computer is always going to be harder than building any other computer after it. And... Yeah. You're also likely to make mistakes the first time around that you won't if you are doing a build again in the future. So, but that yeah. that comes with the territory. And, so, that's part of the fun, honestly. And uh another, you know, Brian I mentioned PC part picker before. Um you uh, one thing that is cool about that, like you said, is you can um See basic uh, compatibilities, you know, definitely if you can do your research on those, a lot of those, but um, you can see basic um, compatibilities, but also you can see other builds that people have done. And if you are kind of feeling like you want to see um, some of the other builds that people have done, like possible combinations, that can be something you can look at. Now you can't really verify outside of pictures that people actually built those but if you want to get a basic idea of what combinations work that might also be looking into if you are feeling overwhelmed with the information yeah and uh on the topic of things to look at um the uh home lab subreddit so let me pull that up real quick So, uh, screen share. Okay. So this is the the Home Lab subreddit. This is actually the wiki. So, um, I will post the link to this in the chat. So, yes, please. There we go. So, yeah, basically, the the Home Lab Wiki it's it's a great place to start if you aren't super familiar with building home labs. Uh, I definitely recommend going through here. There's a lot of ideas for some uses for a home lab, and um, I think you can somewhere through here. There's uh, some recommendations on hardware. I don't know if it's necessarily in the, the wiki, but you can also go to the the main page and you'll have people showing off their builds from anything from servers to full blown server racks to, you know a few memes in here, software discussion, lots of good stuff in there. Very friendly com community and also uh, the data hoarder subreddit if you're building or interested in a storage server look at this subreddit you will not regret it OBS please
because this is there's a lot of you'll see people post deals on here so for example shocking easy stores so those are uh western digital external storage drives so they they're meant to plug in via usb to a, a computer but a lot of easy store models actually included wd red drives and i got I think three of my drives actually came from shucking easy stores myself. So they don't come with the warranty of a WD red drive, but you know, if that's not a big deal to you, then you that's something to look into. Maybe not so much now that uh, these drives are sometimes SMR drives. Um, there's a link to the wiki. Uh, I'm probably just missing it by anyway uh, find the link to the wiki I guess or just do add a slash wiki to the end of the URL and this is a really great starting point if you're trying to set up a storage server. They will tell you things like cloud service providers. So for example, you can back up your data to some other company's servers. For example, uh, Backblaze I know is one that does that. Obviously those cost money. Uh, in a subscription model so if you're trying to build a storage server to get away from that then that is not going to get you away from it but it's definitely an option so hardware so cases hard drives controllers cpus you know you name it software zfs specifically as we talked about a little bit before backups and various guides but yeah anyway so the main thing the main thing that I really love about the, their wiki is that the section about choosing hard drives so they tell you about now I don't know how much this has been updated with all the SMR stuff that has happened but uh, this is a great place to get some information about what drives are reliable, what drives to avoid, and yeah, that kind of thing. So, uh, do take a look. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if SMR has been incorporated into here, but definitely just verify for yourself whether your drive is SMR or CMR before you buy it. Don't don't take any chances on that because you will regret it. So, yeah, that's, I guess that's pretty much it. So, are there any last minute questions or comments before we close out here? Or Trevor, is there anything you would like to add? Um... I think you wrapped it up nicely. All right. So, yeah, I think we will wait just a few more minutes for any remaining questions that might come through. And then I think we will call that a day. Cool. Ooh, okay. Recommendations for a seed box slash build server combo. So, I don't know about you, Trevor. I'm actually not sure what exactly seed box means. 
I mean, I gather build servers for compiling software. Uh, are you familiar with the term Seedbox? Yeah. Actually, I'm not. I have to look it up unless uh, Owen Solis wants to elaborate on that. But um... So I guess we can start talking about the build server aspect of that a little bit. So uh, build server, you, oh, seed. Oh, that's okay. Torrent seeding. So. Oh, I see. I actually don't personally know very much about uh, torrenting and sort of the performance requirements for that. So I can't really comment on that. Other than I would imagine you definitely want some good nicks. And. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about much is uh, networking that's faster than gigabit. So, for example, 10 gigabit or 4.5 gigabit that are both options you can get affordably. I won't say cheaply. Or you can get multiple gigabit NICs and uh, have them operating in parallel or... Um, there's a word I'm looking for, and I'm not getting it. But basically, it's having the NICs, uh, or teaming, I believe teaming is the word, where you have all the NICs essentially working together as one faster NIC. So, but anyway, as for a build server, uh, most... Compilers are pretty good about multi-threading, so something like a Ryzen CPU is probably a good choice for that. Or even some uh, some of the more multi-threaded Intel CPUs. Uh, in fact, some of the more some of the higher-end Intel CPUs might actually be better because even though they don't have quite as many cores, the individual cores are faster with, and they have uh, better instructions per clock speed. So, yeah. Uh, Trevor, would you like to add anything to that? Um, as far as um, the build server aspect, um, if you're planning on using it to build extensive projects, like, um, you know, if it takes days upon days to build, I think ECCUM would be definitely something to uh, consider. You uh, not cut really... out a little bit. Uh, oh, that's the last thing you heard. You, if If you're building projects that take days upon days to build... Or something like that. Okay. Uh, well, if you are, then you might want to consider ECC RAM. Uh, not absolutely that you get it, but um, usually when you're, you know, say, compiling something for a long time, a lot of that is dependent. And so you can't really afford any errors. But, um, yeah, you, you know, like Ravindra said, the. You wouldn't want to get. Uh, part way through that, and then have to restart it because of some sort of memory corruption. Really, anything. Yeah. You also want definitely will not want to skimp out on your power supply uh, if you're going to be having constant load. Um, Would the Power Edge servers you showed earlier be an example of something that might work for that? So, uh, do be aware that those are using older CPUs, so they will not be, they won't, they just plain won't perform as fast as more modern stuff, but, um, you definitely can get cores through that, but I guess... The, the exact level of multi-threading that 
is best for your use case depends on exactly what you're trying to build with your build server, I guess. So, yeah, I I can't personally comment too much on exactly how multi-threaded different compilers are or what the importance is of having, uh, like, say, once you're at a quad core already, is it better to get more cores or faster cores? I don't fully know that, so that's... You can do your research. I don't know if Trevor give you something better than that. I mean, I know that there are... Um, I know that makes me... Or, uh, in particular, you can specify the amount of jobs. Um, but then again, that depends on if the if the thing you're compiling... Um, if, if it's not too dependent on itself so that you can have a lot of parallelism there. Um, but I don't really know too much about that. Um, but, you know, if you have more cores, then you, you do have more of the possibility, as I'm sure Aron Solis already knows, um, to parallelize your comp compilation. But that depends on this actual thing you're trying to compile. Or believe. even if you're trying to compile multiple things simultaneously, then more cores is definitely the way to go. Yeah. Uh, I'm and, mostly trying yeah. to offload portage work from my laptops to something with a little more oomph. So, yeah, I'm not really familiar with Gen 2 and portage, so I'll let you pick that one. Okay, I would ask uh, how... Um... Um, how you're able to offload, how, what options you're looking at enable to, uh, ena bleh, I can't speak, uh, that you're using enable in, in order to offload it. Uh, are you able to just generate those packages on a separate machine and then copy them over? Um, if so, then I think the options that we have been talking about would apply since you're literally just compiling i mean because because portage uses uh to the best of my knowledge it uses uses the make system so uh, what all that we have said here would apply okay using ice cream so that would that's a distributed compiler right i think uh, which i'm not too familiar how that works but if you're compiling something distributed, that would be sort of the same logical. Okay, it is. The it would be the same sort of logical operations that doing it across multiple cores would be as well. So I think I don't know if Ice Cream or Dist CC have the option to just expand the cores, but I think you know the, the comparison between. Um, having uh, different machines that you're distributing the load to versus having multiple cores. Um, the one when you have where you have just more cores would have less overhead. And theoretically, I think that would be faster, but that would have to be probably a case by case basis if you're really trying to measure the performance there. But um, and again, both of them are kind of limited to the amount of parallelism that each comp compilation is. That makes sense. So that's a very interesting uh, use case. I'd like if you do uh, end up building something, I'd be appreciated if you share that. Yeah, and uh, I mean, definitely you can get in touch with us uh, after the stream as well. So don't hesitate to do that if you have more questions or. Uh, if you can, uh, I don't know, get more specific details about the nature of the, uh, what am I saying, the nature of the builds that you're trying to do in terms of how multi-threaded are they versus how dependent on fewer but faster threads. But... Yeah, so I think that is a
pretty good stopping point for this stream. Uh, Trevor, any closing thoughts for the second time? Uh, if uh, I would say that home servers are fun uh, for a variety of interests and use cases. Uh, don't let all the information scare you. Just go out and do it and uh, use the information as you will. Yep, absolutely. I fully agree with everything Trevor just said. So just honestly, just go for it. Like, figure out what you want to do exactly. Do you want to build out a network? Do you want with, like, a network with VLANs and and great Wi-Fi throughout your entire house or whatever? Uh, do you want to just build a little small personal storage server? Do you want to build a large storage server for storing large files? Like, if you're ripping Blu-rays or something like that, to uh, stream them with Plex or some other uh, personal media server solution? Are you just looking for, uh, I don't know, what else? You can, you can create your own sort of uh, computer management network, like a, a Windows domain type of structure if you want, and you can set up, you know, uh, automated backups over the network for your various computers. You know, there there's a lot of possibilities. Even even something as simple as a print server, you can probably set that up with just a Raspberry Pi or something really small and uh and power efficient like that. But all of these things fall under the category of home lab, so it's basically what do you want to make and how will you do it? So I think exactly. with, yeah, so I think with that we will stop streaming for today. So do look forward to more streams coming soon because of the pandemic and all we're just ASC Lug is going fully virtual this semester, so we'll we'll figure things out as they go. But stay tuned for announcements from us about future events, and we will see you around. Thanks for tuning in, and yeah. And before we go, just as a quick reminder, if you are an ASU student. Please sign in. Help if I type the command correctly. Go to that link, put in your ASU ID, and that is basically that is all you need to do. So, with that, uh, thanks to all of you that tuned in once again, and see you around. Cool.